The story starts with a peaceful city facing an attack from a monstrous creature known as a kaiju. As the emergency kaiju alert blares, citizens are directed to safety zones. The colossal kaiju wreaks havoc, prompting the arrival of a defense force, which engages it in combat, aiming to stop its rampage. With previous encounters with such threats, onlookers await the response from different divisions of the defense force. The third division swiftly intervenes, deploying powerful weapons against the kaiju. Among them, a girl wielding a large cannon deals a decisive blow, piercing the kaiju and ending its life. After the chaos subsides, the protagonist, Kafka, marvels at the enormity of the defeated monster. Aware of the cleanup ahead, he informs his group that they'll be working overtime. Nearby, citizens applaud the third division for their successful mission without casualties. While the heroes depart, Kafka approaches the fallen kaiju. His duty begins post-battle, tasked with the unglamorous but essential job of dismantling and disposing of the defeated kaijus. Amidst his work, he gathers a sample of the creature for analysis. Although less celebrated than combat, their task is a battle of its own. In the midst of his duties, Kafka notices someone mishandling something hazardous, resulting in an explosion and injuring someone, underscoring the risks involved in their less glamorous, but crucial work. Fortunately, Kafka is experienced in handling injuries like this, so he manages the situation skillfully. The team faces a daunting workload, and Kafka feels frustrated by the boss's expectation to clean up the massive mess within just one week. Suddenly, Kafka receives news that he'll be reassigned due to staffing shortage, and he's taken aback to learn he's headed to the intestine. Reluctantly, Kafka follows, while his colleagues discuss the unpleasant nature of the intestines. Upon arrival, Kafka is repulsed by the sight and smell but resolves to persevere through his discomfort to complete the task. Exhausted, he returns home that night and diligently tries to rid himself of the lingering odor from work. As he settles in, a news report featuring Division 3 and their captain, Nina, airs. At only 27 years old, Nina has not only risen to the rank of captain but also achieved numerous kaiju kills. Flashbacks reveal Nina and Kafka's friendship and their shared promise to eliminate kaiju together, evoking emotions from both. Nina's remarkable popularity and fame lead to discussions about her potential candidacy for commander of the defense force. Kafka finds himself pondering how he ended up in this situation, but the thought brings him down, so he pushes it aside. He reminds himself that cleaning is valuable work that serves a purpose and allows him to enjoy his favorite foods and live in a comfortable apartment. Thinking this should be sufficient, Kafka goes to bed. The next day at work, he meets Ikakawa, a part-time student determined to join the defense force. A colleague remarks that Kafka once shared Ikakawa's aspirations, but eventually gave up, settling into a veteran role at the cleaning company. Curious, Ikakawa asks, why Kafka quit? And Kafka admits he realized his limitations despite his efforts, there's always someone better. While Kafka tries to maintain a positive outlook, Ikakawa remains resolute, declaring he'll never give up, unable to comprehend Kafka's resignation. Unwilling to engage further, Kafka changes for work, feeling frustrated that he couldn't answer Ikakawa without feeling disheartened. Reflecting on his situation, Kafka questions if giving up is truly a negative outcome. As they begin their tasks for the day, they discuss which parts to preserve for research and which to discard. Ikikawa is assigned to work on the intestines, while Kafka grapples with his thoughts about quitting and the differences between himself and the determined newcomer. Kafka appreciates Ikikawa's determination, but he's dismayed to find himself assigned to the intestines for a second consecutive day. Despite this, he resolves to demonstrate his abilities. While the boss acknowledges Kafka's diligent work ethic, he also notes Kafka's tendency to complain, recognizing Kafka's potential as a defense force officer if he had passed the exam. During their work, Kafka notices Ikakawa's lack of food and offers him a vitamin drink, insisting he eat to sustain himself. Though initially resistant, Ikakawa eventually accepts. Kafka also offers nose plugs to help with the smell, which Ikakawa declines but Kafka persists. At the end of the day, as they clean up, Kafka anticipates the most challenging part is over. When Ikikawa unexpectedly thanks him for his support, Kafka assumes he wants a rematch from their earlier wrestling match but is surprised by Ikikawa's gratitude. As Ikikawa leaves, he mentions the Defense Force's increased age limit, observing Kafka's sadness about the topic. Though Ikikawa suggests Kafka can quit if he wishes, Kafka appreciates the sentiment and acknowledges Ikikawa's understanding, realizing Ikikawa is a better person than he initially thought. Ikikawa maintains his tough demeanor, insisting to Kafka that he doesn't care. But their conversation is interrupted when a monster, known as a Yaoju, attacks Ikikawa. Kafka intervenes just in time to save him, but Ikikawa is shaken by the encounter. Kafka urges Ikikawa to flee and seek help, 
emphasizing that his aspiration to join the defense force would be impossible if he were to perish. Despite Kafka's insistence, Ikikawa initially refuses to leave his side. Eventually, however, he complies and runs off as Kafka leads the monster away from him. As Kafka lures the creature through the city streets, narrowly dodging its attacks, he reminisces about his past with Mina, a friend who also suffered losses due to kaiju attacks. While Kafka's primary concern was finishing his Pokémon game, Mina's sadness over the death of her cat, Miko, revealed deeper emotions. Their determination to join the defense force solidified as they witnessed the destruction caused by the kaiju, prompting them to engage in a playful competition to see who could become the most impressive officer, despite their young age and initial doubts about the idea. Kafka's determination to eradicate all kaiju together with Mina feels distant as he finds himself fleeing from the relentless monster, which ruthlessly demolishes buildings in pursuit. Despite his realization that the situation has spiraled out of control, Kafka resolves to confront the creature, focusing on attacking its vulnerable legs. However, his efforts prove futile as the monster swiftly retaliates, leaving Kafka injured and questioning why events unfolded this way. Writhing in agony as the monster's foot crushes his leg, Kafka resigns himself to his fate, only for Ikikawa to arrive in the nick of time to rescue him. Though Kafka initially berates Ikikawa for risking his life, Ikikawa's steadfast loyalty stems from his desire to fulfill his aspiration of joining the Defense Force. Kafka's mind flashes back to his own rejection from the Defense Force, fueling his self-reproach for his perceived inadequacy. As Kafka reflects on his past failure, his frustration mounts, culminating in a scream of rage just as Ikikawa faces imminent peril. Suddenly, the monster is obliterated, shocking Kafka and Ikikawa, as Mina and her team from the 3rd Division arrive to eliminate the threat. While Mina tends to the injured, Kafka is taken aback by her arrival, realizing that his friend from the past has become a formidable leader. With the immediate danger neutralized, Mina directs her team to search for any remaining threats, leaving Kafka to grapple with a mix of relief and introspection. Kafka lies in critical condition, barely responsive, as he receives medical attention. Later, at Yokohama Hospital, he reflects on Mina's remarkable display of prowess in swiftly vanquishing the monstrous threat, realizing that she has ascended to a level beyond his reach. Feeling isolated, Kafka is surprised to find Ikikawa by his side. Ikikawa acknowledges Kafka's pivotal role in saving him and guiding him to safety, emphasizing Kafka's bravery. This unexpected praise prompts Kafka to recall his rivalry with Mina to become the most impressive officer. Despite Ikikawa's belief in Kafka's potential as an officer, Kafka acknowledges that the decision ultimately lies with him. In a moment of clarity, Kafka metaphorically shakes himself awake from his negative thoughts, recognizing the need to confront his self-doubt. Expressing gratitude to Ikikawa, he acknowledges the younger man's kindness and sincerity. Though Kafka still grapples with the idea of giving up, he realizes the danger of self-deception and resolves to confront his fears head-on. With determination, he reaffirms his goal of becoming a Defense Force officer. However, his declaration is abruptly cut short when he is startled by the sudden appearance of a monster looming above him. The creature claims to have found him and forcefully enters Kafka's mouth, leaving him gasping for air and thrashing in distress. Concerned, Ikikawa rushes to check on Kafka, only to be stunned to find a monster in his bed. Despite the shock, Kafka tries to reassure Ikikawa, urging him to stay calm and recognize that it's still him. However, their peace is disrupted by the arrival of an elderly man summoning the Defense Force. Panicked by the implications of the Defense Force's involvement with the Kaiju, both Kafka and Ikikawa fear the consequences. Reflecting on a past conversation with Mina about combating Kaiju, Kafka recalls advising her on how to immobilize the creatures by targeting their legs. Assuring her that he would support her when the time came, Kafka now realizes the weight of his past assurances. Meanwhile, Mina receives word of a kaiju sighting at Yokohama Hospital and immediately resolves to confront the threat. Determined to take action, she mobilizes her team to eliminate the kaiju and protect the city. A warning blares out to alert everyone about the spotted kaiju. Inside the hospital, an elderly man quakes in terror as he faces the monstrous creature. The stress triggers a second heart attack, though judging by his condition, it seems more like his third. Ikikawa, in a stroke of brilliance, attempts to calm the elderly patient by having Kafka smile at him. However, this unexpected gesture causes the man to faint, collapsing onto the floor on the verge of rigor mortis. Concerned, Kafka rushes to check on the old man, but his gentle touch unexpectedly shatters the wall, startling both him and his student. As other patients emerge to investigate the commotion, they catch only a fleeting glimpse of the monster before the defense force arrives. Sensing the impending danger, Kafka and Nikakawa decide to make a hasty escape. 
Kafka bolts towards the window, forgetting his own strength, and inadvertently tears through the wall. Ikikawa manages to leap onto a nearby platform just in time, but Kafka, taking a single step, is launched through the air like a jumbo jet. Meanwhile, the defense force receives word that the kaiju is retreating from the hospital and heading towards an evacuated area. With the kaiju on the move, Kafka and Ikikawa sprint as fast as they can, relying on their own legs to carry them to safety. Ikikawa ponders silently how his mentor could possibly be a kaiju, questioning the feasibility of such a transformation. When he turns to confirm Kafka's identity, his eyes widen in shock at the sight of his teacher morphed into an even more grotesque creature, akin to some kind of special mode. A strange appendage emerges from Kafka's mouth, swiftly snatching a nearby bird and devouring it raw for sustenance, much to Ikikawa's disgust. Surprisingly, the impromptu meal triggers Kafka's reversion to his original kaiju form. As they flee, Kafka suddenly feels the urge to relieve himself, prompting Ikikawa's confusion as to how this is possible without the proper anatomy for urination. To their horror, Kafka expels urine from two spots on his chest, a bizarre lactation of yellow liquid. Distraught and fearing social rejection, Kafka collapses in tears, worried about his prospects for marriage and joining the defense force. Eventually, they reach their destination. Ikikawa assumes that once they enter, the area will be empty due to the evacuation. However, just before they leap over, Kafka senses something approaching. Ikikawa wonders if it's the defense force, but Kafka informs him that the presence is underground. Suddenly, they catch sight of a kaiju emerging. The appearance of the monster alerts the unit on their way to handle the initial sighting. Mina instructs one unit to proceed while she investigates the new location. As they head there, Kafka recognizes the kaiju as the same type that attacked earlier. Ikikawa deduces that fewer reinforcements will be sent to their location, providing them an opportunity to conceal themselves. Despite the evacuation of the area, where the new kaiju appeared, there seems to be a complication. The sound of a girl crying from beneath the rubble. Her mother is trapped, and the girl struggles to lift the debris. Unfortunately, lacking the strength to move it, she is unable to rescue her mother. The mother urges her daughter to flee, but the determined girl insists on trying to save her. As the failed rescue attempt unfolds, the kaiju emerges and targets the girl. However, a powerful punch suddenly strikes the monster, sending it flying. Kafka marvels at his strength and rushes over to check on the girl's well-being. Understandably, she is frightened by the presence of the monster. Kafka tries to reassure her with a smile, but it only adds to her fear. Finally, Ikikawa arrives, and Kafka lifts the slab off the unconscious woman. Assuring the girl that her mother will be fine, Ikikawa advises her to stay calm. Meanwhile, the previously defeated monster returns for another round. Kafka instructs Ikikawa to evacuate the civilians while he prepares to deliver a powerful blow. After charging up his energy, Kafka delivers a punch that obliterates the monster, reminiscent of Saitama's feats. The creature's essence rains down, staining the ground red. Despite his heroic actions, the girl remains fearful of Kafka. As Kafka walks away, the girl expresses her gratitude, triggering memories of Mina's appreciation. Determined not to abandon his goal of joining the defense force and protecting Mina, Kafka's human form partially returns as he vows to fulfill his promise to his childhood friend. When the defense force finally arrives, they find themselves perplexed by the aftermath of the event, with even the tiger appearing bewildered. Mina approaches the girl to inquire about the kaiju she encountered. However, the girl trembles in fear, so the soldier assures her that she will eradicate all the kaiju. This reassures the girl, but she pleads with Mina not to harm the good kaiju who saved her mother. This revelation leaves Mina utterly bewildered, rendering her speechless. Three months later, a news broadcast displays a drawing based on eyewitness testimony of a kaiju named Number 8, which piques the defense force's keen interest as they continue their nationwide search for it. Kafka's co-workers watch the broadcast, while Ikikawa, aware of the situation, stands in the background. He recalls receiving a letter addressed to him and Kafka, with instructions to deliver Kafka since he left early for work. The letters contain the results of the exam they took, revealing that Kafka used to participate in it annually. Ikikawa opens his letter and finds that he passed the first round. He takes Kafka's letter with him, but curiosity gets the better of him, and he opens it on the way, discovering that Kafka also passed. The crew looks on happily, knowing Kafka has another chance to pursue his dream, though it's his last opportunity, as he won't be able to enter again after this. Ikikawa arrives and shares news with his master, but when Kafka turns around in his monster form, his student drop kicks him out of anger for exposing himself. He's especially upset because Kafka appeared on the news, prompting Ikikawa to caution him to be more careful and conceal his transformation, as they successfully did at the hospital. Reviewing his results, Kafka isn't as excited because he consistently fails the second round of exams. 
Passing the first round isn't anything new to him. Concern for the next stage, which will have officials present, Ikakawa warns Kafka of the risk of being killed if he transforms. Despite the danger, Kafka is willing to take the risk, having tirelessly searched for a way to revert to normal without success, especially now that he's 32 and unlikely to get another chance. Ikakawa reluctantly agrees to support his teacher's decision, but warns Kafka that if anything goes wrong, he'll leave him behind and continue the program alone. He suggests they proceed as rivals. However, when Kafka struggles to open his water bottle, he involuntarily transforms again, prompting Ikakawa to advise him to skip the exam. Despite Kafka's assurance that he'll have it under control, Ikakawa insists he gets a grip and then walks away. On the day of the second round, the duo arrives at the Defense Forces base in Takakawa, completely awed by its grandeur. Ikikawa observes that the base they've arrived at is larger than the one they visited on a field trip, prompting Kafka to explain that Takakawa's base is shared with a self-defense forces garrison, enabling quick deployment of forces across western Tokyo, when needed. As other candidates start arriving, one of them takes issue with where Kafka has parked. She demands Kafka, whom she mockingly calls an old man, to move his car so she can park there, despite ample space elsewhere. Kafka takes offense and threatens to teach her a lesson but the girl reveals a suit granting her super strength, allowing her to lift and toss the company car. Ikikawa is curious about her identity. She introduces herself as Kikoru Shinomiya, whose hobby is hunting down kaiju. While Iwa seems to recognize the last name, Kikoru's attention is solely on Kafka, telling him he smells like a kaiju after sniffing him with her powerful nose. Kafka introduces himself as examinee number 2032 and impressively instructs the kid to remember his name. However, his grand introduction is interrupted when he notices that Kikaru's butler has taken his parking spot. Initially, Kikaru expected the exam to be dull, but she finds it increasingly interesting. She expresses determination to outshine Kafka and departs. Ikikawa is angered by Kafka's premature use of his powers, but Kafka defends himself by noting that he only transformed a part out of sight. They reassure some guards that the noise was insignificant. But Ikikawa warns Kafka that any further antics will result in him being sent home. Realizing that this is his final opportunity to stand beside Mina, Kafka resolves not to give up this time. However, moments later, Kafka struggles immensely during the exam. Despite his consistent training and rigorous physical regimen, he finds himself unable to keep pace. A flashback reveals Ikikawa explaining that the second stage of the exam consists of two parts, a fitness test and an aptitude test. As they cannot alter their aptitude, their focus should be on excelling in the fitness test. Unfortunately, Kafka is having extreme difficulty. He has always been somewhat below average, but his performance has significantly worsened. Falling further behind, Kafka wonders if people truly become this weak after turning 30. Despite considering transforming, he dismisses the idea as absurd. Regrettably, Kafka performs poorly and receives a rank of 219 out of 225. Kikaru then reveals that she secured the fifth rank, taunting Kafka for how swiftly she outperformed him. Kafka reflects on how he initially made a dramatic statement about remembering his name to Kikaru, but now he wishes she would forget it. Ikikawa expresses relief that Kafka refrained from using his power, and Kafka acknowledges that it wouldn't have been fair since everyone worked hard to reach this point. Although Kafka made his previous statement to appear confident, he secretly wishes he had used his powers. Kafka is confident that he would have performed better if he had used his power, but Ikikawa suspects there may be another reason for Kafka's low rank. Meanwhile, Mina reviews this year's applicants with her subordinate. Despite his assumption that Mina is only concerned with eliminating Kaiju, he is surprised when she expresses interest in learning more while she continues working. Her subordinate highlights a candidate named Nazumo, who graduated at the top of his class and is considered highly promising. Ikikawa also notices Nazumo, who ranked second. The third-ranked candidate is Iharu, the valedictorian of a prestigious university. The top-ranked applicant is Kaguragi, a rising star in the Japan Ground Self-Defense Force. These candidates, along with many others this year, hail from top university, indicating a departure from the usual path of aspiring to become elite officers. Kafka attributes his low rank to the presence of such highly skilled applicants. Ikikawa notes that among these talented individuals, one person stands out, Kikaru. Kikaru graduated from California Neutralization at just 16 years old, skipping grades and becoming the youngest ever to do so. She is regarded as the greatest talent ever and is being closely watched by the top candidates who hope to measure up to her. Ikikawa emphasizes that the group of applicants is exceptionally skilled, with Kikaru being particularly noteworthy. Kafka expresses surprise at Kikaru's impressive ability, 
but he ends up being reprimanded by her bodyguards for touching her. Onlookers assume Kafka is one of her admirers. Despite being teased by Kikaru, Kafka vows to prove himself. However, he privately acknowledges that things aren't going well, though Ikikawa remains hopeful. In the past two years, the second part of the test involved disposing of kaiju corpses. This tests the examinee's knowledge of kaiju and their ability to work as a team. It also demonstrates that the job entails more than just defeating kaiju. Ikikawa decided to work part-time at the disposal unit because of this aspect of the test. Kafka's optimism is renewed, and they decide to focus all their efforts on the next part of the exam. Upon arriving at the second training area, they are greeted by Hashin, the vice captain of the third division. He explains that he will oversee the aptitude test, which involves locating kaiju. Kafka's excitement turns to shock when Hoshner reveals that they not only have to find the kaiju but also neutralize them. This surprises Kafka, especially when a powerful kaiju attempts to attack Hoshina, only to be stopped by security measures. Despite his initial shock, Kafka notices that the top applicants are eager for this part of the exam. However, Kikaru laughs at Kafka's reaction, prompting him to question why they can't just dispose of the kaiju's bodies as before. Ikikawa shares Kafka's disappointment explaining that disposal was the norm in previous years. Hashina emphasizes the danger of this part of the exam and informs them that they will be provided with Izumo Tech gear for protection. Ikikawa tries on the gear and is impressed as it analyzes his body and adjusts to fit perfectly, enhancing his strength and becoming like a second skin. These suits are Demon Defense Force combat suits made from organic material extracted from Kaiju, significantly increasing the wearer's combat abilities. In another location, Konami, the division operator, announces that she will begin measuring the combat power of those wearing the suits. She reveals that Ikai's combat power is at 8%, Izumo's at 18%, Keiji's at 15%, and Aihai's at 14%. This unleashed combat power indicates how much of the suit's potential power the wearer can utilize. Normally, even after extensive training, it's only around 20%, and it's rare to have an applicant score above 10% in a year. However, all three of these guys are over 10% prompting Hashina to wonder if this year will be unprecedented. Suddenly, everyone is stunned as Konami reveals that Kikuro's unleashed combat power is at 46%. This astonishes everyone, with Hashina considering her to be at the level of a platoon leader despite not yet joining the force. It's assumed to be a record-breaking achievement. While Ikikawa feels disappointed with his 8%, Hashina reassures him that it's still commendable for a first attempt. As long as the examinees don't score a zero, they will pass. Hashina admits he's never seen a zero before. However, the mood shifts when Kafka's unleashed combat power is revealed to be 0%. This surprises everyone, leading to laughter and even speculation about a possible error by Konami. Kafka asks for more time, hoping to increase his combat power. However, Hashino finds the situation amusing, comparing it to something as simple as using the bathroom. He appreciates Kafka's determination, but doubts he'll succeed in passing the exam. Kafka believes there might be a method to boost his percentage and diligently tries to discover it before the exam concludes. Kaidru becomes frustrated with his efforts, wishing he would demonstrate the same power he showed in the parking lot. As Hashina enters the room, he announces the beginning of the final part of the exam. He reveals that their targets are one Hanju and 36 Yaoju, positioned throughout an urban training area. These Kaiju caused 16 casualties and were captured alive for training purposes. Examinees will engage them with anti-kaiju weapons, while drones monitor their progress. If an examinee is in danger, their suit shield will activate to protect them, but this will result in exam failure. Given the high risk, Hashina emphasizes that survival is not guaranteed. Examinees must decide whether to participate, and Hashina initiates the test. Despite the danger, Kikuro boldly leads the charge, swiftly defeating two Yaoju and impressing everyone. Kafka urges them to move forward quickly to avoid falling behind but Ikikawa points out that Kafka is the one slowing them down. Kafka defends himself by explaining that the weapons are too heavy without the suit's assistance. He tries to make it seem impressive by suggesting that only he, as the Zero, can understand this, but Ikikawa disagrees. Their situation looks bleak as Ikikawa highlights their lack of offensive power compared to the others. Just then, Hashino announces that Mina has arrived to observe the exam. Kafka recalls their previous challenge to determine who could become the more impressive defense force officer, and he regains his composure. He decides to disregard being labeled a zero and focuses on seizing this final opportunity. Kafka realizes something and asks Ikikawa why they are being monitored by drones. He suggests that if their purpose was simply to track how many kaiju each examinee eliminates, 
sensors would suffice. However, this isn't the case. In addition to evaluating their ability, the exam is assessing their adaptability to different situations. They both understand that, lacking offensive capability, their role is to support the attackers as effectively as possible. Spotting a nearby altercation, they position themselves to offer assistance. Kafka spots the hooves of the Yaj, recognizing it from a previous cleanup operation. His experience proves valuable as he recalls that stun grenades are highly effective against this type of Yaju, which has poor eyesight but keen hearing. Once deafened, they become vulnerable targets. Drawing from his expertise, Kafka instructs Yuzumo to target the Yaju's stomach, its weak spot. The attackers follow his advice, successfully defeating the creature. Grateful for Kafka's support, they express their appreciation, though Kafka is still bothered by being labeled as Kikuro's follower. In the observation room, Kafka and Ikikawa's actions catch the attention of the observers. Kafka points out to Ikikawa that they have dismantled numerous kaiju bodies, gaining valuable knowledge in the process. Feeling confident in their ability, Kafka is relieved that he doesn't need to rely on his kaiju power anymore. He becomes excited at the prospect of redeeming himself for past mistakes. However, their optimism is short-lived when another kaiju suddenly appears. It sends Kafka crashing into a building, and Konami detects severe injuries. Unable to continue the battle, Kafka is at the mercy of the approaching Yaju, prompting them to activate his suit shield. Kafka realizes that they're likely to activate the shield, which would result in his failure in the exam. Aware of Mina's presence, he musters all his strength to get up. Determined not to embarrass himself in front of her any further, he prepares to face the approaching beast. Meanwhile, Konami initiates the remote shield activation, and Hashino reflects on his prediction that Kafka would be the first to drop out. Despite finding Kafka amusing, Hashino feels disappointed by his early exit. However, just as the Yanju is about to attack Kafka, it is suddenly obliterated. Kikaru notes that she has outdone Kafka once again and asserts that nobody quits while she's on the battlefield. Ignoring Kafka's off, she insists that he stay down like a loser while she continues to take down more kaiju. Witnessing Kikaru's prowess, the other examinees are amazed but refuse to let her monopolize all the action. Kikaru effortlessly dispatches another Yanju leaving Aiharu to wonder if she's using the same suit as them given her incredible power. Kafka desires to pursue the main target, but his leg is fractured, rendering him unable to stand. Hashina discloses that Kafka has multiple fractures and potential organ injuries. Despite this, Kafka refuses to entertain thoughts of giving up. Recalling the despair of seeing his 0% combat power, Kafka reflects on his belief that only the talented succeed, which frustrates him. Hashina suggests Kafka withdraw from the exam cautioning that the suit shields are not infallible. However, Kafka remains resolute, asserting his autonomy and deciding whether to persevere. Despite feeling too old for aspirations and fearing ridicule, Kafka resolves to stake his entire life on his dreams once more. As Kafka voices his determination, the observers are astonished to see a marginal increase of 0.01% in his combat power. Kafka reaffirms his commitment not to surrender this time. Regardless of the challenges, catching Mina's attention. Kafka makes a firm declaration that he won't give up this time, catching Mina's attention. Despite his broken leg, Kafka proudly stands, astonishing Konami. Ashino agrees to let Kafka proceed but warns that he'll activate the shield if things go south. Kafka tells Ikikawa to go on without him as planned, but Ikikawa decides to support him instead. Realizing Ikikawa's true character, Kafka accepts his assistance. Hashina finds amusement in their situation as Ikikawa carries Kafka, though Ikikawa feels embarrassed. Despite Kafka's pain from his broken bones, Ikikawa offers to be their legs while Kafka uses his knowledge to handle the attacks. Hashina, finding their interactions comedic, just wants to move past them. Kafka instructs Ikikawa to follow Kikaru, impressed by his friend's speed. Meanwhile, Kikaru races ahead, defeating Kaiju and leaving her companions behind. Ikikawa advises Kafka to be prepared to aid her once they catch up. As they observe Kikaru's actions, the others feel disappointed that they can't assist her. Konami announces that Kikaru has eliminated the last Yaoju in the area and is now battling the Hanju. Kikaru agitates the beast with a grenade, positioning herself for a decisive strike. Kikaru calmly remarks that this is the final one as she slowly pulls the trigger, prompting Hashina to smirk as she shoots into the monster. Konami is amazed as she declares that the Hanju is defeated, marking the completion of the exam's last stage. The boys are shocked that they couldn't assist, with Kafka stating that Kikaru is simply too fast. Now, Konami only needs to retrieve the drones and send medics for the injured. Hashino is surprised at how quickly the exam ended despite the lengthy setup. Mina is impressed by Kikaru's remarkable power, even catching Hashino's attention. Although it was expected that at least 30 people would drop out, 
none did, and Hashina attributes this to Kikaru's influence. Given that she is director Shinomiya's daughter, such performance is expected. Hashina is confident that she will become a significant figure in the defense force, offering hope for the entire country. Meanwhile, Kikaru hopes she made her father proud by excelling on the battlefield. She relaxes, intending to tease Kafka further, but is suddenly shocked as a strange being appears behind her, causing massive damage instantly. Everyone is horrified as the fallen kaiju begin moving again. Kikaru barely managed to shield her heart by concentrating her shield's energy on one spot, but she resolves to keep fighting. She's astonished when the mysterious monster starts speaking and questions how she can still stand. Recognizing it as a kaiju, Kikaru is taken aback by its intelligence. Despite her intention to attack, the monster swiftly strikes her multiple times, causing Kikaru to cry out in pain. Konami observes her vital signs dropping, puzzled by the situation. They detect life signals from the supposedly defeated kaiju, but what's truly alarming is that the revived Hanju's strength is estimated at level 6.4, significantly higher than before. Realizing that such a powerful foe requires a full company to defeat, Hashina reflects on the limited number of capable individuals. At Mina's urging, Konami activates remote shields for the examinees and recalls some drones. Recognizing their own capability to confront the Hanju, Hashina and Mina prepare to engage it. Despite evacuation orders, Kikaru adamantly refuses to leave, feeling responsible for preventing further casualties. She uses her suit's capabilities to staunch the bleeding, determined to continue the fight. At that moment, Kikaru recalls her father's admonition to strive for perfection for the nation. Motivated by this ideal, she demands nothing less than perfection from herself. However, her resolve is swiftly shattered as the Hanju easily knocks her aside, leaving her barely able to move. Despite her dire condition, she staunchly refuses to admit defeat. Reflecting on her past, Kikaru recalls the pride she felt upon achieving the top grade in her class. While other students celebrated with their parents, her own father's response was indifferent. He emphasized the fleeting nature of success and urged her to focus on future goals rather than dwelling on past achievement. Her father's relentless pursuit of perfection, driven by a sense of duty to the nation and the memory of her late mother, continues to influence her actions. With his words echoing in her mind, Kikaru resolves to persevere. Determined to heed her father's teachings, she refuses to allow anyone to surpass her and fights back with all her remaining strength. Even with just one arm functional, she remains steadfast in her determination to fight. Despite her valiant efforts, the relentless onslaught proves too much, and she is once again overwhelmed by excruciating pain, her screams echoing her anguish. Suddenly, one of the drones detects the hand, and Konami is astonished to witness the regeneration of its severed offensive unit organ. Concern clouds Hashina's expression as Konami identifies the creature's preparation for a devastating attack. Despite their urgency, Hashina and Mina rush to the scene, uncertain if they will arrive in time. As the beast readies its formidable assault, Kikaru resigns herself to her seemingly inevitable fate. Overwhelmed with remorse for not meeting her father's expectations of perfection, she tearfully apologizes. However, just as the Hanju prepares to unleash its onslaught, Kikaru is astonished by Kafka's sudden appearance and words of encouragement. Bewildered by his presence, she braces for the monster's attack. To her astonishment, the attack fails to harm them, and Kafka begins a startling transformation. Commending Kikaru for her efforts in buying time for the evacuation, Kafka assures her that he will handle the situation from here. Meanwhile, frantic evacuations take place elsewhere, with Kagaragi impressing Nazuma with his strategic use of flares. A flashback reveals that Kafka and Ikikawa were ordered to evacuate moments early, with strict instructions not to return as Kikaru confronted the revived Hanju. While Ikikawa was prepared to comply, Kafka had already disappeared. Ikikawa hoped that Kafka hadn't resorted to his transformative ability, knowing the consequences if he had. As Ikikawa rushes to the scene, he realizes that Kafka is indeed bold enough to transform without hesitation in such dire circumstances. Meanwhile, Kikaru is utterly stunned by Kafka's transformation, unable to comprehend how he could be a kaiju. However, Kafka reassures her that he is still himself and pleads with her not to inform the defense force. Suddenly, Kikaru is filled with terror as the Hanju unleashes its immensely powerful attack once more, but Kafka effortlessly deflects it. Promising to explain everything shortly, Kafka assures Kikaru that he only needs a moment to defeat the beast. Just then, Konami detects an exceptionally powerful energy source near the Hanju. With their communication disrupted by the explosion, they have no visual confirmation but receive a reading on the creature's fortitude, which Konami finds hard to believe. Supposedly, this mysterious creature possesses a fortitude of 9.8, leading Hashina to dismiss it as impossible, attributing the anomaly to the explosion's effects. 
Acknowledging the significance of such a high fortitude, Hashina speculates on the potential implications if it were true, hinting at the creature's unprecedented strength. Meanwhile, Kafka powers up to match the immense power of the Hanju. Apologizing to the creature, Kafka acknowledges his dwindling time and prepares to end the confrontation with a single punch. As Kikaru watches in awe, Kafka's punch meets the Hanju's, resulting in the annihilation of the beast. The shock on Kikaru's face is palpable as the Hanju's body parts scatter in all directions. Kafka feels satisfied with his actions and jests with the monster to see if it can revive after his attack. However, when the creature begins moving again, Kafka hastily implores it to cease, clarifying that he was only joking. Despite his initial uncertainty, the monster is truly defeated. Kikiru, witnessing these events, can't help but ponder who this enigmatic individual is. As another Yaoju threatens Kikiru, Kafka intervenes and unveils his face, assuring her safety. However, he admonishes her for recklessly endangering herself. Their conversation is interrupted by Ikikawa's arrival, who reprimands Kafka for his risky actions. Kafka explains that he initially intended to transform only a part of his body, but altered his plan upon encountering the Hanju. Despite Ikikawa's scolding, their discussion halts when Kikaru faints. Shortly afterward, Mina and Hashina reach the scene, perplexed by the extent of the damage inflicted on the Hanju. Konami's report of Kafka's safe exit signals the completion of the evacuation. While acknowledging Kikaru's strength, Hashina doubts she could have single-handedly obliterated the Hanju. Mina observes the anomalies of the revived Kaiju and the blast area, highlighting the mysteries surrounding the situation. She orders an investigation unit to examine the area, while she and Hashina eliminate the remaining Yaoju. Reflecting on the similarities to an incident three months prior, Hashina speculates about possible connections. Later, Kafka finds himself back in another hospital. Ikikawa updates him on Kikaru's recovery, noting that she's receiving treatment using the Defense Force's top technology. Reflecting on the exam, Kafka realizes the challenge of competing against exceptional individuals. It reinforces the notion that pursuing one's dreams often means facing tough competition. Despite this, Kafka acknowledges the excitement that comes with chasing dreams, regardless of the obstacle. He expresses gratitude to Ikikawa for his encouragement. Suddenly, Jesta and Mina unexpectedly appear to express gratitude for Kafka and Ikikawa's assistance in escorting Kikaru to safety. They depart swiftly, leaving Kafka contemplating reaching out to Jesta. Deciding against it for now, Kafka resolves to wait until he achieves his goal of becoming an officer. He feels more confident than ever in this aspiration, silently vowing to prove himself to Jesta. Nearby, Kikaru experiences a nightmare about failing to meet her father's expectations of perfection. Upon waking, she wonders if her father has arrived, only to find Hashina by her side. He reassures her that there are no casualties, attributing the successful outcome to her defeat of the Hanju. Kikaru's surprise prompts Hashina to question if she truly defeated the creature. Kikaru recalls Kafka's words and confidently asserts that she was the one who defeated the Hanju. That night, a news report recounts the events of the exam, highlighting the injuries sustained but emphasizing the absence of fatalities. Meanwhile, in a restroom stall, the intelligent and mysterious kaiju eavesdrops on the news, expressing surprise and disappointment at the lack of casualties. Suddenly, the phone rings, prompting the monster to remind himself how to answer it. Upon answering, the voice on the other end instructs him to return to duty. The monster transforms, dons a uniform, revealing himself to be a new member of Kafka's disposal unit. As concern lingers for Kafka and Ikikawa's well-being following the exam, the new recruit ominously conceals his transformation. At the hospital, Ikikawa mentions that Kafka is starting to appear dependable. However, once they return to work, he retracts his statement. Kafka, feeling terrified, blames Ikikawa for encouraging him to retake the exam. Ikikawa points out that he was expressing gratitude for that at the hospital, and their argument is interrupted when they receive letters. The guys prepare to open them and agree to do so simultaneously. After thinking about catching up to Mina, Kafka is shocked by his exam results. Later, at the Defense Force base, the students who passed the exam gather. They notice Kikiro's absence, but aren't surprised by the results. The room falls silent as Kikiro enters, revealing she got the top score. Izumo had anticipated ranking first before the exam, but he now assumes they'll have to vie for second place. However, Kagaragi disagrees. Having scored highest on the fitness exam, he still aims for the top spot. Ikikawa introduces himself to Aiharu, who wonders where Kafka is. Assuming Kafka didn't pass, Ikikawa looks worried. Just then, Mina arrives to start the introduction ceremony, and Kikuro is chosen to speak on behalf of the incoming class. The 27 of them are now considered officers of the Defense Force, and Kikuro declares they'll lay down their lives for the cause. 
Kakuro is then shocked when Mina personally thanks her for saving everyone during the exam. Kakuro becomes really sad, knowing Kafka should be hearing these words, and wonders why he isn't there. He not only saved her life but also worried about her as if she were a little girl. She becomes enraged, feeling completely humiliated, and still seeks answers as to why he transformed into a kaiju. Just then, everyone is shocked as Kafka arrives late to the ceremony. It turns out that Kafka actually failed the exam. He scored the lowest on the fitness exam and received a zero on his aptitude test. During a meeting over who would pass, Mina was about to say something about Kafka, but Hashina interrupts and declares that he will take Kafka. Kafka's numbers say that he doesn't have what it takes to be an officer, but what he showed on the battlefield says otherwise. Kafka was able to locate the enemy's weak points, and he prioritized helping others over his own kill count. Most importantly, though, Kafka really made him laugh. Hashina isn't sure if Kafka will ever become a full officer, but he will bring him into his platoon as a cadet so he can receive more training. Mina now explains that he's enrolling as a cadet, so she had him skip the introduction ceremony. Kiku is glad to hear it, and the top guys are too. Mina then gives a speech about how the kaiju are getting stronger, and she won't be able to guarantee the survival of the new officers. However, she vows to stand at the very front so she can act as both their shield and spear. Kafka gets really caught up in her speech and loudly declares that he will be standing next to her soon. Everyone is shocked as they call him crazy for calling the captain by her first name. First speaking out of turn, Mina tells him that he owes her 100 push-ups, but he thinks about how it was an accident. Hashino laughs uncontrollably and points out that Kafka is already back at his funny ways. Mina leaves, but Hashina wonders if he just saw her smile a little bit. Konami can't believe that Kafka's already bringing the comedy, but Hashina explains that this place can get pretty gloomy, and they need a guy like him. However, Hashina secretly has another reason for keeping Kafka around. He noticed something strange when they detected the 9.8 fortified kaiju. Hashino still believes that it was just a busted sensor, but what he noticed is that someone's vitals stopped coming in at the same time. This person was Kafka, so Hashino thinks that there's something strange about him. He has decided to keep Kafka close so he can find out what that something is. Down below, everyone cheers on the old dude as he completes the 100 push-ups. Kiker wants to speak with him, so the guys assume that she wants to confess her love. She denies that, so Kafka assumes that it's one of those meet-me-after-school-behind-the-gym kind of things. Kikaru denies that as well and just tells them to come with her. He does and Kikaru is shocked when Kafka reveals that a kaiju forced itself into his mouth. Kafka wonders if he can just tell the defense force the truth as they might be able to cure him. Kikaru is sure that it's a terrible idea since if they don't eliminate him on the spot they will surely make him spend the rest of his life being tested and having experiments done on him. Even worse she has heard a rumor about what they do with kaijus powerful enough to get a number. Here's what's next. After they are defeated, their body parts are used for a special weapon. Kikaru fears that this will happen to Kafka, so he begs her to keep his secret. She agrees to do so, but if he ever tries to harm humanity, she vows to end his life. Everyone gets very serious, but Kafka's actually counting on her to do that if things go bad. Later, everyone watches as Ikikawa performs a training exercise. He completes it in just over two minutes and a half, and it is announced that his estimated unleashed combat power was 18%. Everyone gasps in amazement, and Hashina is impressed by how much he has grown in such a short period of time. A hero can't believe that Ikka would just set another personal best score, so he jumps into the exercise next. He goes real hard as he refuses to be outdone. A hero finishes in 2 minutes and 15 seconds, with an unleashed combat power at 20%. A hero is really pleased with himself and he tells Ikakawa to not get too cocky. Just then everyone is absolutely stunned as Kikaru finishes in 1 minute and 15 seconds with an unleashed combat power at 55%. Hikaru taunts the boys as both their scores combined are still worse than hers and Nezumo can't help but feel average around her. Kaguragi points out that he doesn't have time to worry about those better than him as he now has the same combat power as him. Nezumo promises that he will set a new best when it's his turn and all the powerful rivals stare at each other with great intensity. However, the intense moment is broken up when an exhausted Kafka finishes the exercise in 6 whole minutes and has a combat power of 1%. Kafka is actually really happy about this as he has turned the 0% from before into a 1. Kafka demands that Kikaru praise him, but Hashino points out that he will never become a full officer at this rate. In fact, he will probably be fired in just 3 months. Hashina has them all run 10 laps and gives them an extra 5 for complaining about it. Konami can tell that there are a lot of rivals in this class and Hashina is glad that they're all pushing each other to become better. Afterwards, the guys are all exhausted and Nairu tries to argue with Ikikawa about who has bigger muscle. 
Kafka tells the kids to stop arguing and shows them the muscles of a hardworking grown-up. Kafka can't hold his stomach in for long though, and Iharu points out that he can't join the defense force with a spare tire like that one. Kafka tells them all that it will happen to them too after they turn 28, and demands that they arm wrestle him to see who is stronger. Just then, they are all put to shame when Kagaragi enters the room with his bulging muscle. In the laundry room, the girls in the class are shocked to find Mina. Kikuru admires how in shape she is, but she knows that that alone doesn't explain her amazing combat power. Kikuru would like to know what kind of training she has done, so Mina instructs her to stand next to her. Kikuru is shocked that Mina wants to show her right now, but she eagerly agrees to do it. Back at the bath, the guys discuss why they decided to join the defense force. Iharu was saved by Captain Mina as Shiro, so he always wanted to be a hero like her. All the other guys share the same desire to become heroes because of her. Kafka is amazed about her inspiring so many people, and Ikakawa points out that she is their generation's superhero. They all want to know Kafka's reason, and they are shocked to learn that he was childhood friends with Mina. They are even more stunned to hear that they made a childhood promise, so Kafka tries to sneak away. The guys stop him though and demand to hear the rest of his story. After the girls' bath, Kikuru wonders if something happened to the guys, as they don't look too good. It turns out that they were so caught up in conversation that they stayed in the bath too long. They were talking about Mina, so Kikuru just calls them stupid boys. The class would then go on to do even more training exercises. There were a lot of times of tension, but it's pretty clear that they were forming a bond together. They were doing practically everything together and growing stronger as a team. Kafka would one day fall behind during a run, but his buddy Ikakawa was there to help him keep going. One night Kafka refuses to sleep, as he knows that he must work twice as hard as everyone else. Hashina surprises him and points out that sleep is pretty important too. Kafka refuses to let himself get tired, and Hashina wonders if he's doing it all for Mina. Kafka can't believe that he knows about that, so Hishina tells him that he should assume that every word he says in the dorm is being recorded. Kafka declares that he made a promise to fight by her side, but Hashina points out that that could be interpreted as Kafka trying to steal his spot as Mina's vice-captain. Kafka hesitates for a moment, but confidently declares that that is what he intends to do, and he will do his best to make it happen. Hashina seems annoyed, but he allows Kafka to have two more hours for study. Before he leaves though, Hashina declares that he will not let Kafka have his spot next to Mina. Kafka thanks him anyway, but Hashina warns him not to get too close to the other officers. This is because anything could happen at any time. Just then an alarm sounds and everyone wakes up. This is exactly what Hashina was warning him about and he tells Kafka to get ready for his first mission. This bring an end to our episode 5. If you enjoyed it then don't forget to like, share and subscribe for more amazing recaps.